This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. God bless each and every one of you, and welcome to the New Harvest Midday Inspirational Meal Time. And I'm your host today, Bishop Marcus A. Johnson Sr., and it is my privilege to share with you this review on today of all that we have done this week. Let's pray now and ask God to bless this meal over his word that completely satisfies the longing of our souls. Let's praise, pray now. Father, we thank you for this meal that you blessed us to receive. We ask you to sanctify it for our consumption's sake. Bless every individual near and far that will consume this word, this truth, that will receive the word of God and allow it to nourish every part of our being. We thank you, O God, that your word lives forever because your word is eternal. Bless every individual as they hear this word, that it will speak to them where they are and direct them where you would have them to go. We thank you for this platform. We thank you for this audience. We thank you, O oh God, for this opportunity. So we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Indeed, it is a privilege to sit with you and just to kind of review. We've kind of learned that it's significant to rehearse what we have covered. Why? Because we don't want it to go in one ear and out the other, but we want it to be planted in us so that the Holy Spirit can bring it back to our remembrance at the very time that we need to put it into action. Our theme, heritage and legacy walking through. And so it, 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 it speaks of looking at all of the different leaders and models and examples in the book of Acts who literally stand as heritage and all of the followers in the church as legacy as the work of Jesus Christ that has been handed on to the church in the physical realm continues on. Jesus ultimately forever remains heritage. But even Jesus came to do the will of his father, heritage. And so you can see that the concept, it's alive and it's well. Our series, Holy Spirit as Heritage, Empowering the Church as Legacy. The book of Acts is about the Holy Spirit as heritage and the church as the legacy of the Holy Spirit. And so let's look at where we've been this week. I ask you please to hit that like button as we go through the lesson and what those numbers do when you hit the like button, it causes others to be drawn to our page. So hit that like button. That's, that's really an essential as we go through this study because we want others to share in what God has done granted us the privilege to have. On Monday, we looked at Acts chapter 12, Herod Agrippa's persecution. Herod Agrippa's persecution. We could say King Herod Agrippa's persecution. Who are the main characters in Acts chapter 12? Well, King Herod Agrippa, James, the brother of John, Peter, four squads of soldiers, the angel of the Lord, Mary, the mother of John Mark, saints gathered at Mary's house praying for Peter, Rhoda, who was Mary's housekeeper, James, the half-brother of Jesus, Tyra and Sidon, representatives, Blastus, King Herod's chamberlain, and Tyra and Sidon, audience for Herod's speech, Barnabas and Saul. That's a lot of characters. That's a lot of characters. So let's let's now look at it and let's review the highlights from our lesson on Monday, Acts chapter 12, Herod Agrippa's persecution. One, Herod Agrippa's persecution was against the church as he martyred James, the brother of John, and imprisoned Peter with chains and four squads of soldiers. Now, that's the main action that gets this chapter started. And so it looks like King Agrippa is in, in a seat of advantage. He's the power broker here. And he's the one that's making this wheel of persecution turn. 
Two, Herod Agrippa's persecution imprisonment of Peter was miraculously overturned by the angel that released Peter from prison. We can say praise be to God. King Agrippa had Peter locked up, but the angel of the Lord unlocked it, unlocked the chains and set Peter free. There's nothing too hard for God. Nothing. Three, Herod Agrippa's persecution could not stop Peter's release and appearing at Mary's home, knocking where saints were praying for Peter's deliverance. Isn't this amazing? Now, here the saints are at Mary's house, and, and, and it's important that we distinguish the different characters that have similar names as others. So this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus, not her house. This is the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, who's also called Marcus. And so <clears throat> the saints have gathered at her house, and they are praying for Peter, who is locked in jail. The angel of the Lord releases Peter from imprisonment. And then he goes and he knocks on the door where the saints are gathered and they are at prayer. Now, we know Mary was a very renowned woman. She was a woman of means because she had a housekeeper. And she had a house large enough to accommodate a group of people that would designate a church. Highlight number four. Herod Agrippa's persecution backfired after the cities Tyre and Sidon praised him, Herod, as a god for his eloquently blasphemous response to provide their cities with food, disregarding the Lord as the true provider. So what was happening here? Tyre and Sidon cities that had really fallen out with, with King Herod. And now they make friends with his chamberlain, Blastus, and Therefore, they make a petition that Herod would grant them the ability to be given a supply of a portion of food. And so Herod gets dressed up and sits in his throne and eloquently gives a speech. And it was awesome. And Tyre and Sidon, those, those representatives, they were so grateful that he had consented to providing food for them, and that they felt he spoke so well. They said he's a God, and he let them say it. He disregarded the Lord as the true provider. And so we know what happened. The angel of the Lord struck King Herod, and he died. He died as worm food. The worms ate his carcass. Here's the key verse for us to hold on to from Acts chapter 12. When you think of Acts chapter 12, here are two verses to, to really focus on. And the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. Well, first of all, that was not true. Herod was a man. He was a mortal man. But they, the people from Tyre and Sidon said, oh, it's not a man. This is the voice of a God. And immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him, smote King Herod, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. So let, let, let's look at this. Let's look at this. Here's the context. Here's the context here. Let's look at the condition in which this took place. The cities of Tyre and Sidon petitioned King Herod to supply them food to which they affirmatively responded. He affirmatively responded with an eloquent speech. Subsequently, the people glorified him as a God that he wrongfully received until being struck by an angel for taking God's glory. You get the story now? That's Acts chapter 12. Here's a concluding takeaway. Here's something for us to walk away from this lesson with. Whether an angel miraculously releases one from bondage or a person is empowered to charitably, charitably feed cities, all the glory and praise belongs to God. And though one may not have control over misdirected offerings of praise, 
one is responsible to redirect all glory and praise to God. What does that mean? You may not can control what a person sends your way. You may not even know they're going to say or do what they're going to do. But once they have put the ball in our court, it is up to us to make sure the ball goes where it rightfully belongs. The glory belongs to God. The praise belongs to God. Oh, sure, it's okay for people to acknowledge uh, the role you play in and, and performing a good deed, certainly to acknowledge your, your kindness, so forth. You are a child of God, and so therefore, that should be an attribute of us. However, when one starts saying you're not a man, but you're a God, and one starts honoring you as though you are a God, that's where... That's where you draw the line in the sand and say, oh no, uh-uh. And we watch Peter, we watch Paul and Bar Barnabas. We saw them do this repeatedly. Don't, don't worship me. I'm a man just like you. Worship God. That was on Monday. Then on Tuesday, we looked at Acts chapter 13. The shift from Peter to Paul. Now, prior to Acts 13, Peter was the noted leader if we would consider heritage, it would be Peter. He stood on the day of Pentecost. He was working his way on up even in the ministry of Jesus Christ. However, after Jesus was ascended, Peter is the one who stood up. Peter stood as a leader, as heritage. And so we see all through the movement here, Peter is the prominent figure. However, chapter 13 of Acts, Paul who's called Saul, he comes to the forefront. Now let's follow, let's follow. The shift from Peter to Paul, the main characters in Acts chapter 13. Simeon, who's a black man, among other Antioch church prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Saul, called Paul. Salamis, synagogue of Jews. John Mark, who's called Marcus, who also happens to be Barnabas' cousin, Bar-Jesus, also called Alemus. He's a false prophet and a sorcerer. And Sergius Paulus, a proconsul or a governor. And Antioch and Poseidon, synagogue rulers and audience, and the whole Poseidon city. Let's look at the highlights now. What are the highlights in Acts chapter 13? The shift from Peter to Paul. One, the focus of ministry began the shift from Peter to Paul as the prophets and teachers in Antioch. Here the Holy Spirit sanctioned Barnabas and Saul to go forth for ministry. So not only is this a shift from Peter to Paul, we're now even shifting some of the action from Jerusalem to Antioch and some of the other surrounding cities and regions. So the focus of ministry began the shift from Peter to Paul as the prophets and teachers in Antioch. Here the Holy Spirit sanctioned Barnabas and Saul to go forth for ministry. They have been officially commissioned to go forth, Barnabas and Saul. Two, the shift from Peter to Paul resulted in a prominent spirit-led travel throughout the Cyprus island where Bar-Jesus or Alimus, a Jewish sorcerer, attempted to dissuade the governor, Sergius Paulus, from believing the gospel preached by Paul. So Barnabas and Saul confronted opposition as Alimus, a Jewish sorcerer, tried to stop the governor from being influenced by Barnabas and Paul's ministry. Three, the shift from Peter to Paul early on resulted in John Mark, Barnabas' cousin's defection, going back to Jerusalem while people in Antioch and Pisidia desired Paul and company to speak freely and abide with them. So the Bible doesn't give us the details. There's some conjecture what may have turned John Mark off. But the point is, John Mark or Marcus started off with Barnabas and with Paul, and then in the course of their journey, he defected and went back to Jerusalem as Paul and Barnabas and those that with him continued on 
in their ministry. Four, the shift from Peter to Paul allowed Paul the opportunity to rehearse the ancestral history of Israel from Abraham, Moses, Israel's wilderness wandering, inheriting Canaan through the judges up to Samuel, King Saul and David to Jesus, the son of God. And so Paul stood up and began to rehearse the history in the form of a lesson or a sermon. And why was he doing that? Because he knew his audience, some of them were familiar with his history. And he wanted them to see how God's hand has moved through time from the Jews now being extended to the Gentiles. This is, this is, this is good information. And highlight number five, the shift from Peter to Paul attracted quite an audience in Antioch as well as opposing Jews who Paul addressed as the cause of the gospel now being extended to the Gentiles who rejoiced upon hearing this. So what's happening here? So Paul makes it real clear that the reason why we're ministering in Antioch is because Jews who have opposed the gospel have caused the Lord to shift now the focus from the Jews to Gentiles to receive the same gospel because Jesus Christ died for all. Jesus Christ did not die for Jews only. He did not die for Gentiles only. He died for Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jews. So Jesus Christ, for God so loved the world that consists of every kind of culture and, 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 and every kind of ethnic group you name is contained within the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that what whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when the Gentiles heard this in Antioch, they rejoiced. They celebrated because it meant a way had been made for them to come in. Here are key verses to remember from Acts chapter 13, verses 45 through 47. But when the Jews saw that the multitudes, these are the opposing Jews, when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, to the Jews. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of the everlasting life, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Glory be to God. And so Peter primarily, who preached to the Jews, has now moved in the background now as Saul comes forth because now the focus and the emphasis that was to Jews only is now being extended to Gentiles. Here's the context. Here's the context of these verses. Despite the entire city coming out to hear the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, the entire city, Jewish distractors were present to dissuade their impact. But the Lord uses the rejection of the Jews to become an open door to the Gentiles to receive salvation until the tribulation where Israel as a nation shall receive Jesus as their Messiah. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Shall receive Jesus as their Messiah. And so what's actually happening is that the age, the era has shifted from the initial focus during the ministry of Jesus Christ, really the Old Testament through, because remember now, we're looking at the covenant of God with a people, Jews, that are the children of Abraham. And so we see all that in the Old Testament. And then we see in the ministry of Jesus, who was born into the Jewish culture, we see the focus to giving salvation information to Jews. But they rejected the Messiah. Therefore, as a nation, they did. And therefore, after Pentecost, after preaching, and many Jews came to Christ, but many opposed. Now the shift has gone 
to the Gentiles. And God has done it, and it will continue this way until the tribulation. Church will be raptured, and then yet, through the persecution during the tribulation, then Jews will call on the Messiah. And they will also evangelize during the tribulation. And Gentiles left in the earth, will many will get saved. Many will not. Then Jesus will return with the saints and will set up his kingdom, millennial reign. And those Jews will receive him as their savior. The Jews who rejected him as a nation will accept him as a nation. Here's our concluding takeaway. Let's remember not to be discouraged as witnesses of the gospel when the message is not received because for everyone that refuses truth, somebody's yet waiting to receive it. So we see in the text that the city came out to hear Paul and Barnabas minister. And though many rejected, there were those that were waiting to receive it. Don't ever forget that. Then on Wednesday, Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas, despite persecution. Paul and Barnabas, despite persecution. The main characters, Paul and Barnabas, Jews and Gentiles in the synagogue in Iconium, the impotent man in Lystra, the priest of Jupiter, and the church in Antioch. These are the main characters in Acts chapter 14. Here are the highlights. Here are the highlights. One, Paul and Barnabas. Note now we're not saying Barnabas and Saul because Saul is Paul. We're now saying Paul and Barnabas. Now, Paul is taking the lead. Barnabas had to let him in because the disciples didn't want to accept him. They were afraid of him. They knew of him as a terrorist. But now that he's given his life to Christ and the Lord has filled him with the Holy Ghost, now is Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, despite persecution, pursued the Jews and Gentiles in Iconium with the gospel, and half of the city believed. Half of the city, God, if, oh Lord Jesus, if half of Baltimore would believe, good God, there'd be a revival like we've never seen. Two, Paul and Barnabas, despite persecution, having to relocate to Lystra, pursued souls, and the lame man from birth was healed. Oh, hallelujah. This is what happened because they didn't stop the ministry. They kept going. Three, Paul and Barnabas, despite persecution, continued preaching the gospel until unbelieving Jews from Antioch and Iconium aroused the people to stone Paul. So even though half the city accepted the teaching and the preaching, listen, understand this, and they had to move on to Lystra because of enemies, well, now we've got these Jews that have instigated a mob, if you will, and they are now determined to stone Paul. For Paul and Barnabas, despite persecution, returned from Derby to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch, where they had many converts and enemies, as they continued to preach and establish elders over the growing churches. So Paul and Barnabas didn't keep still. They kept moving, and they established churches where they traveled. That means that there were converts and believers. But even in that, the enemies continued to show up, continued to come forth, and yet they continued on with the ministry. Acts 14, verse 19 through 20. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So they were determined to kill him. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. So here's what happened, and this is what the key verse is focusing on. An attempt was made to kill Paul, and perhaps those Jews thought he was dead. They left him thinking we got rid of him. But with the saints standing around him, Paul got up and continued on with Barnabas in ministry. Here's the context. The unbelieving Jews erupted in a riot, stoning Peter and leaving him. I'm, I'm sorry, stoning Paul. Let me correct that on my notes. Stoning Paul and leaving him for dead. But God who received Stephen, who was stoned, resurrected Paul 
to continue in ministry. So God can work it however he wants to work it. It's his, it's all his work anyhow. So a concluding takeaway. Let's remember God's plan cannot be thwarted by persecution, but will always flourish in due time, despite every satanic opposition. God's work will always go forth. God's work cannot be stopped. Then Thursday, Acts 15, church dispute. Really, the dispute is really a theme in Acts chapter 15. I want you to think about Acts 15. I want you to think about dispute when you think about Acts 15. Here are the main characters. Pharisaic brethren from Jerusalem, Paul and Barnabas, Jerusalem apostles and elders, Peter, James, the half-brother of Jesus and leader in the Jerusalem church, Judas, Judas, Barsabas, Silas, Silas, and John Mark. Here are the highlights. Highlight number one, a church dispute erupted in Antioch as Pharisaic Jewish brethren from Jerusalem began to teach salvation by faith with works, emphasizing circumcision, to which Paul and Barnabas contended greatly against this false doctrine. It was the move of Pharisees that would bring this contention as Gentiles are coming into the church. Two, Peter stood up amid this ongoing church dispute and rehearsed how God allowed him to give the gospel at Cornelius' house, to which they believed and received the gift of the Holy Ghost, as did the Jews on Pentecost. Cornelius' house were Gentiles. Three, this church dispute was silenced as Paul and Barnabas testified of their work performed among the Gentiles. Four, the church dispute is settled as the apostles and elders send Paul and Barnabas along with Judas, Barsabas, and Silas from Jerusalem with epistles designating the resolve, ensuring equity among all believers, that there's no reason for them to have to uphold the law. Five, after the recent church dispute was resolved, another dispute erupted between apostles Paul and Barnabas concerning John Mark accompanying them as he had defected from their previous journey. So you can see there was a lot of contention in Acts chapter 15. Key verses, Acts 15, 30-32. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. So they left from the council in Jerusalem, where the apostles were, and they went back to Antioch and said, the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised to be saved. That is not what is the requirement? The requirement of salvation is faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to God. Here, here's the concluding takeaway. Let, let me read this context one more time. After the Jerusalem council convened to address the contention over the Gentiles being required to observe the Mosaic law as a condition for salvation, it was resolved by the council of apostles and elders, that salvation is by faith alone and therefore does not require any yoke being placed upon Gentile believers. Here's a concluding takeaway. Church disputes are not to be handled in a corner, the pews, or an open arena, but rather to be taken before the church polity to hear from God and be led by the Holy Spirit for resolve of unity and love. And this is what took place in the early church. Let us pray. Father, we thank you now for this meal. We thank you, God, for all this biblical history. Now bless us to, to be able to digest it and bless us to be nourished as we follow the model of the early church, heritage and legacy, walking through. We give you the glory and the honor. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. Hit the like button, please. And we will see you on tomorrow. We will see you tomorrow, 1 o'clock. 
for our question and answer. So God bless you in Jesus' name. Love you all. God bless.